If you're ready for the message today, let's go. The title of my message today is titled Final Words. Final Words. If you bless you. If you've never been to Minnesota before, we're known for our summers. Our summers are beautiful. Um, yesterday in Oklahoma, I was sitting at a Starbucks because it was 80 degrees with the light breeze. I had my laptop doing my master's class homework, and I was getting a full-on tan because in Minnesota, we live in igloos and hunt with spears, and it ain't like that. <laughs> so I am at the local Starbucks getting a tan on, feeling good about life, and I'm like, this reminds me of Minnesota summers. I should just move to Oklahoma for March. This is great. <laughs> so it's a Minnesota summer day. It's beautiful out. It's about 8 o'clock at night. I'm driving down the highway. My windows are rolled down in my car. The smell of bonfires are filling the air. The smell of grills and smokers with smoked meat are filling the air as I'm driving down the highway. I got the music cranked up. I'm feeling good. A beautiful summer night. As I'm driving down the highway, I see something that totally catches me off guard. There's this big field to my right, and there's like this 50-year-old man wearing a kilt and playing the bagpipes. I just heard a lady go, oh! Here's the deal. If you're not from Minnesota, you're like, oh, y'all wear kilts at the age of 50. That's cool. No, we don't. We don't. But here's the deal. It made me stop because what you don't know is my dad and I have a Scottish-Irish heritage and we share this passion for the bagpipes. If you've never heard a bagpipe sound, when it's played correctly, it is this beautiful, unique sound. When it's played incorrectly, it sounds like a flock of geese that are dying. <laughs> it's bad. Oh! And so I'm driving, this guy's playing the bagpipes in this field. This isn't normal in Minnesota. So I turn around, and I pull off to the side of the highway. I turn down my music. And I hear one of the most beautiful songs and one of the most beautiful sounds on a beautiful summer night. And I just hear this song coming from the bagpipe. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And I hear him playing and I get, to, I get emotional listening to this song. I immediately call my dad. It goes to voicemail. I call him back right away because I know how much he loved this. It goes to voicemail again. I just go, hey, Dad, it's your boy Micah. You're not going to believe it. Dad, it's a beautiful summer night. The, the sun's setting. Dad, I'm driving down the highway, and I see this guy playing the bagpipes. Dad, listen to what he's, listen to what he's playing to, Dad, and I hold the phone off the window. Amazing grace, how sweet. The sound. I pull back to my ear and I go, Dad, I'm just thinking of you. I know how much you love this moment. I just wanted you to share it with me. I love you so much, Dad. I'll talk to you later. And little did I know, those would be the final words my dad ever heard me say. My dad would get on a motorcycle later that night, and he'd end up passing away in a motorcycle accident. And my dad was at the bar with his girlfriend, and he listened to the voicemail at the bar. And my dad started to break down and cry when he heard this voicemail and heard this song about the amazing grace of Jesus. How sweet this sound that saved a wretch like me. Know what's crazy to me? Every person who's ever lived, every person in the history of mankind who's ever lived and ever been born, at some point along the way, every person will have final words. And if you're like me, you're just like, oh man, that's 90, that's 80, that's like way older in life. I don't have to worry about that. But what we really don't recognize is no one really knows when our last day is. And I just have a question. When we get to say our final words, 
Well, they actually match a life that lived them. I don't know if you've ever seen someone pass away. I've seen a lot of it. But I've been in the room where hospice workers leave. And they let the family hang around the member that's going to die. And if you've ever been in a moment like that, you see how somber. You see how crazy it is. Watching someone who was once living right in front of you. Now take their last breath on this earth. And a lot of times those people will share some final words with their family members. I don't know about you. But when my family members hear some of my final words, I don't want it to be smoke. I don't want it just to be vapor. I want it to be like that's a guy who lived what he said. And today I wanted to encourage Discovery Church how to live a life that was worthy to what God wanted for every single person in the room. And here's the deal. Scripture actually gives us the roadmap on how we live a life that honors him. And where I wanted to bring you today was somebody's final words in the Bible. And I believe the final words he shares is a blueprint for us to build our lives around. His name is Joshua. Did you know Joshua was 90 years old when Moses died and God tasked him to lead the Israelites into the promise? 90. And if I'm Joshua, I'm like, God, why couldn't you have asked when I was 30? Why are you asking at 90? There's a lesson in here for people. Joshua was 90 years old when he got the reins to lead and 110 when he died. If you're 80, 70, 60, and you got breath in your lungs, God ain't done with you yet. There's still a purpose and a reason to your existence. God's never been moved by age. He's always been moved by faith. Joshua was 90. And there's some 80-year-olds today who are hearing me talk about that. And you're like, dear Jesus, let someone else lead it, not me. Let the young one go. Let him do it. And for all the young people who are like, yeah, you get them. No, I'm coming for the young ones now. Here's the deal. Joshua waited 90 years before he was ever tasked with the ability to lead. Are you willing to submit and stay under leadership and honor people long enough to let God order your steps for when it's time for you to lead? God can't bless what we dishonor. And God can't bless who we dishonor. Joshua knew what it meant to lift Moses' arms long before anyone would ever hold his arms. Don't discount the season you're in now by leading through dishonor. Always find a way to live honorably to the Lord and to others. But here's the deal. Joshua shares some final words that I think will apply to every person in the room here today. And know what Joshua does before he dies? In verse 1, it says this, it's on the screen, Joshua 24, verse 1. It says, then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, the leaders, the judges, and officials of Israel. They presented themselves before God. In other words, Joshua's about to die. He knows this. This is his final speech, and he gathers everyone. He says, get everyone. Get everyone, because here's the deal. For the next 10 verses, know what Joshua does? He recounts the story of God. And God's story in their life. You want to know how you live this thing out? Number one is this if you're taking notes. We've got to gather ourselves and our families around the story of God. We have to do this. We've got to gather ourselves and our families around the story of God. For the next 10 verses, Joshua is telling the Israelites what God did. Here's the deal. As people, we are either building two different kinds of empires. We're either building God's kingdom through our life here and now that lasts forever, or we're building our kingdoms that eventually turn to dust and utterly meaningless things. We get to choose how we build our life. And Joshua is saying this, the pathway forward, the pathway forward to this life is to remember God's story, to gather yourself around the story of God. You know what I dream of someday? 
I dream of being that 80 year old, 90 year old grandpa at Thanksgiving and Christmas and I have all my kids and my grandkids around the table and my grandkids are gonna start rolling their eyes because they know what grandpa's gonna start talking about. I want when my kids and my grandkids get around my table, I want them to hear the story of God. How God showed up in our family. How God showed up in broken situations. How God delivered us and set us a new trajectory and a new story. Why? Because I want my family around the story of God. Because if my kids and my grandkids can get around God's story, I know they got a chance of making it just how I was able to make it. Because it's not how great I am, it's how awesome and how amazing he is. Oh, by the way, I want to be that 80, 90-year-old grandpa who carries the little candies in his pockets and flicks them to all the kids at church and gets all those parents ticked off at me because they're trying to keep sugar out of their kids. I want to be that grandpa who's so sweet, so old, and all the little kids come begging on my pockets because they want the candy I got in there. I'm convinced the older I get, the more sweet I should become. You want to know why? Because it's more years of walking with Jesus, more years of being near him, that I no longer sweat the small things. But I'm older in years, I'm older in my life, and I realize the small things really aren't all that big of a deal anyway. But I'm called to love Jesus and love people. Some of you are sitting here saying, well, I don't even know where to start. This is my first Sunday. I don't you say, gather myself around the story. I don't even know what that means. What it means is every single day, gathering yourselves around his story. It's opening up the Bible. You're like, well, I come to church all the time, and I hear about opening up. I, don't, I have no idea what to do. I'm glad you asked. I read one chapter of Psalms a day. You want to know why? Because the psalm writers who wrote the book of Psalms are emotional wrecks. Know who else is an emotional wreck? Me. And know what it gives validation for? My emotional wreckness that I can praise God by being an emotional wreck. I can still praise him no matter what I walk through. That God is worthy of praise no matter what valley I find myself in. And Psalms gives credits. It gives ability for me to suffer, but know God's still going to come through. And then I spend one chapter in Proverbs a day. You want to know why? Because a proverb a day keeps the devil away. You know what I love about God? He knew how foolish his creation would be, that he dedicated a whole passion in his Bible called Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes. It's called wisdom literature because God knew how we would need his wisdom to make it. You want to know why I read a chapters of Proverbs a day? Because I know how foolish I can be. And without God's wisdom, I'm not going very far. I need the wisdom of God, not my own wisdom. I need the fear of God in my life because that's the beginning of it. So every day I spend a chapter in, wis in, in wisdom in Proverbs. And then I spend one chapter in the Gospels a day. You want to know why? Because I desperately need to be the words, near the words of Jesus every single day. You know what happens when I gather myself around this story? Faith begins to build. Faith starts to build up in my life. And I need that. I need God's story. My wife, when I'm out of town, brings our children to church. And she got home from church one Sunday, and she calls me. She said, Mike, I got to tell you what happened to our boy Malachi. I go, yeah, what's going on? She goes, he came home from church. He grabbed your golf club. He grabbed an iron and went out to the rocks. He was taking the golf club and smashing the rocks with your golf club. I go, what, what, what? Did, you, did you stop? I'm like, what you? And she goes, I said, Malachi, stop. Stop hitting the rocks. What are you doing? Those are dad's golf clubs. Stop. And Malachi goes, Mom, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty, Mom. He goes, Malachi, what are you doing? Stop. Stop hitting the rock. That's Dad's golf club. He goes, Mom, God told me to do it. God told me to strike the rock, Mom, and water would come. My boy was in kids' church that Sunday. He heard about the story where Moses was told to take his staff and strike the walk, and water would come forth. My boy believed water would come forth from taking a golf club and smashing rocks. Can I just tell you, I will take damaged golf clubs any day if it means my son is believing and hearing the story of God. He gets to gather himself around God's story and that he believes God can do the impossible. 
You want to know how you gather yourself and your family around the story of God? You show up to church every single Sunday. Every Sunday. When I go on vacation, I don't look to get a break from church. I can't wait to get to church in whatever state I'm in, visiting on vacation. You want to know why? Because the people in Florida, Hawaii, Alaska, wherever we're vacationing, those people are my brothers and sisters just like you are. The kingdom of God is bigger than Yukon, Oklahoma. It's filled with every nation, tribe, and tongue of people who worship Jesus. And church ain't about me, boo-boo. Church is all about him and glorifying his name. When I get to church, I want to gather myself around the story of God. Do you want to know why? Because Pastor Kevin and Joseph, when you come and you're not done, you're done visiting, you want to make this church your home, they open up the Bible and share with you God's story because they know the only way for us to make it is to gather around his story. It's why when you come to church, your faith is built up. It's why it's a struggle just to get here. But the minute you get here, you're like, oh, man, I'm really glad I came today. I'm glad I came to church today. We can't afford to miss Sundays. We need each other. When you're gone, we feel it. When you're not here, something's missing. Why? Because you are part of the body of Christ. We are called to individually gather ourselves around his story, but we're also called to gather corporately around the story of God. Man, you're like, why is this guy so passionate? Like, what is his deal? You want to know why? Because the best thing a single mom ever did is when the divorce happened and her husband left her, my dad, she picked up a phone. She called her friend. She said, where's the best church for me to bring my kids to? And I remember showing up in our Chrysler minivan with the wood panels on the side. A blue one with the wood panels. If you ain't never seen it. Google it. They're amazing. I would love to actually rock one. That would be amazing. I could totally rock one. By the way, Tegan, would you stand up? This is a young man who has a call of God on my life. I try to never travel alone. And Tegan, I just want to honor you and say, keep following Jesus. I'm really proud of you. Thanks for coming with me. Keep going, bro. That's Tegan. Sorry, when I was talking about the wood panel minivan, I just pictured me and Tegan rolling into the parking lot with our wood panel van and People who are 50 plus come and be like, I had one of those. Where'd you get it? <laughs> yeah, I know. They're amazing. I have the wood panel Chrysler van. We pull into the church parking lot and it was just like this church. And my mom goes, you need to get out of the van and come to church. And I looked at my mom and said, nope, I'm never going to church. I'm staying right here. I don't know anybody in this building. I'm staying right here. My mom looked at me, and I learned a lesson that day. My mom said, if you don't get out of the van and come to church, I'm going to get a man from the church to come drag your butt into church. What I learned that day, don't ever mess with crazy church moms. You know the ones that just look at you and know all your sins? They're like, they just see your inner, like, you're like how do you know what I'm dealing with right now? They're crazy church moms. My mom was one of them. I was like, no way she's not doing that. I go, mom, I'm staying right here. My mom left, went in the church. She brings the biggest man she could find, comes walking out the church doors. I immediately hide under this church, like the van. I hide under the van seats. I'm thinking my mom's going to look in the windows and realize, oh, he went into church. He's a good boy. Now, crazy church moms know when you're hiding and you're lying. The man opens the door, big, scraggly, bearded guy, sticks his head under the van seat. He goes, son. You need to get your butt into church and listen to your mom. I'm like, yes, sir, I'm coming. Here I go. All right. <laughs> I go into church. Wanted nothing to do with God and didn't want to be there. I watched my own dad never step foot in church. Why would I want to follow God when the very dad who introduced me wants nothing to do with him? That Sunday... I ended up meeting the best man who was in my wedding, one of my best friends, and his family took me under their wing. It's why when I guest preach in churches around America, I don't see you as visitors. None of y'all are visitors to me. When I see you, I see a man who paid for me to go to summer camp when a single mom couldn't afford it. When I see you, I see a man who helped me go on my first mission trip as a teenager because a single mom couldn't afford payments for her kid. When I see you, I see men 
who invited me over to their house to show me how a man treats a wife, how a husband loves his wife. I saw what family dinners look like. When I see you, I see people who knocked on my door around Christmas time and dropped off cash in an envelope because a single mom couldn't afford Christmas gifts for her kids. When I see you, I see people who brought groceries to our doorstep and took care of us when we didn't know if we'd make the rent payment or not. You aren't visitors to me. You are the very people who believed in me in the next generation and gave me a chance to do what I'm doing today. <clears throat> I'm older now, and I understand what my mom was trying to do all along. My mom knew as a single mom with four kids she could make it. And she knew the only way she could ever make it is if she could somehow gather her family around the story of God. I want to put a picture up of my little boy. My son may never remember any of my sermons. He might not remember anything I said from a pulpit. But know what I pray my son remembers? Is I watch dad get in the Bible every day. And my son might not know it now. But I bet you when my son's my age... I just wonder if my son's like, you know what, my dad wasn't perfect. I watched my dad make some mistakes. But know what I remember about my dad? He'd open his Bible every day. And I get it now. Because I understand my dad knew he couldn't make it. Apart from what Jesus said was meant to be daily bread. Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Parents, grandparents, it's not too late to start. Kids... Don't always do what we say, but they will always do what we do. And they love to catch on to it. Let's gather our families around his story. And then number two, you want to know how we do it? Number two is this, is we're called to rid our homes of sin. Rid our homes of sin. After Joshua gets explaining everything that God did for them, the God story of their life. In verse 14, it says this. Now, here's what I want you to do. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Get rid of it. Throw it away. It's the same call in the New Testament. Paul writes in Hebrews, get rid of every sin that so easily entangles. Throw it away. You know who Paul's talking about? He's talking about the parents, the grandparents, the great-grandparents. He says, throw away the gods your parents, your grandparents. Throw away those gods that they serve. My dad divorced my mom and left for another woman. You know what my dad watched as a boy? My dad watched his dad leave for the neighbor lady and divorced his wife for another woman. My dad's one of 11 kids. Big Roman Catholic family. I have watched generational, I've watched ancestry type stuff as a young boy. I have a word for someone in the room. You don't have to follow in the sins of your ancestry the sins from your parents, your grandparents, it doesn't need to mark you and it doesn't need to mark the future generations that are coming after you. But because of the grace of God, in light of God's story and what God's done, guess what? We can throw away every sin that so easily entangles. Get rid of it, men. What is under our roofs right now that's hurting our marriages? Man, what's under our roof right now that's hurting future lines? What's hurting our kids? What's being allowed into our house that God has clearly said, get rid of it? I brought my boy to the largest candy store in Minnesota. Hence, I'll be the 80-year-old who's got candy. Just, you know, I love, I love that. What I didn't know is some older man gave my son a witchcraft card at the store. I didn't know it. My son brought home a tarot card. It was on her floor. I pick it up. I go, son, what's this? He goes, dad, an old man at the candy store gave me this. 
I immediately grab this witchcraft card. I take it, rip it to shreds, chuck it in the garbage outside my house. I go back to my son's bed where he's laying down. I put my hands on my son. I say, God, let every spirit of defilement that's tried to get in my home get out of here and go back to hell where you belong. Get out of my house. You can't have my son. And I pray, God, would you wash him by the precious blood of Jesus? Would you wash my boy? Cover our house. Cover our, sin, our, cover our sins, God. I remember there was a time I was out of town and my wife came in the living room and our kids were watching something inappropriate. My wife turned off the TV, grabbed our kids' hands. She knelt down and looked them in the eye and said, kids, we don't watch that in our house. That's yucky. Kids, let's pray. My wife began to pray a covering and a protection over our kids. And she prayed this prayer specifically. God put a fire in our little kid's belly that when they see evil, they run away from it. About a week goes by and my daughter goes, Malachi, turn it off. Malachi, stop. My wife runs in the room. She goes, what's the matter? And Everly speaks up and says, Mom, something yucky came on the TV and I felt a fire in my belly. We can't change anyone. We can't change our spouse. We can't change our kids. We can't change anyone. But we can pray to the God who's faithful to give our kids discernment in moments where his Holy Spirit kicks in. We're called to rid our homes of sin. And then, not only are we called to gather around God's story and rid our homes of sin, but I Third and last point is this, is as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It says in the text, it says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day to whom you will serve. Whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And the Hebrew verb that's used there is the past tense, a present tense, and a future tense. Joshua in his young age, we will serve God. Joshua as a teenager saying, we will serve God. Joshua presently at 110 years old, we will serve the Lord. And future tense, no matter what comes our way, we will serve God. We need homes. That will live in such a way that says, as for us, we're going to serve God. My grandpa, my mom's dad, they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Remember when my mom called a friend and said, where's the best church to bring our kids to? This is a picture of my grandpa. His name's Grandpa Dave, my mom's dad. Doesn't he just look like a grandpa? Like, it just looks like the grandpa from Up. All that's missing is some balloons and Russell with his backpack. I'm sure my grandpa had badges that he could give Russell too. He just looks like a grandpa. That's Grandpa Dave and he was a Lutheran pastor and the Holy Spirit filled him one day. And he began to teach his Lutheran church about the Holy Spirit, and he was kicked out, excommunicated from his church. You know what my grandpa did that very next Sunday? He could have looked at his eight kids living in the inner city of Minneapolis and said, See, kids, church will hurt you. See, kids, church is all about them, their doctrine, their ways. See, kids, forget God. He could have walked out. He could have. That's hurtful. You know what he did that next Sunday? He brought his wife and all eight kids to a different church down the block. You want to know what he's trying to do? Gather his family around the story of God and to lead his kids into a scenario that they would remember forever, which is this. Man might hurt you. People might fail you. People will guard their organizations but God will never fail you. God is faithful.
my grandpa was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And before he passed away, he told every nurse, every hospice worker the gospel. And all my grandpa said, he said, my biggest regret in life was waiting till I was dying to tell everyone about the love of Jesus. I wish I wouldn't have waited. You have the easiest invite of all time in a month called Easter. And yet you and I won't care to ask anyone to be a part of God's story and see what God wants to do in their life. Before my grandpa died, he got to have some final words. And he invited all eight of his kids and every grandchild to come to his house. And he wrote out a note card specific for each kid with a Bible verse on it. My grandpa said, Micah, come here. I walked over to his bedside. He placed his hands on me. And he read this Bible verse over my life. My grandpa didn't know what I was going to do, where I was going to go. Look at this Bible verse. This is what he spoke over my life. These were his final words. It was scripture. He says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. What my grandpa didn't know is that one day I would travel the United States of America seeing many people come to righteousness. And it hit me. My grandpa said some final words that wasn't just smoke, but the words that he spoke over his kids and his grandkids are the kinds of words that will never pass away. What will our final words be? Will it be a life that lived them, a life that was matched? It's possible you're a grandparent, a dad, a teenager, and you feel beat up by this message. If that is the case and you feel like you're just a bat, you blew it, then let me remind you of the final words of Jesus. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the forgiveness of Jesus runs deeper and greater than any sin, any mistake you've made as a parent. In fact, I think if God could give his church a song to sing and remember, it would sound like, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I am found was blind but now I see you want to know what the story of Jesus is it's an amazing grace you want to know what the story of Jesus is for your life? Amazing grace. He loves you. He's for you. There's a girl in the way back against the wall. Yep, you, don't worry, I ain't going to call you out. I just feel like God wants to stop the whole service for you. To let you know how loved you are. And how he sees you. He doesn't see you through the lens of mistakes. He doesn't see you through the lens of anything in the past. He stopped the whole service just for you. You're his daughter. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. His grace is for you, not against you. His heart is for you. Not as only for her. It's for every man, grandpa, for every person in the room. In a little bit, I'm gonna ask you to come to this altar just to take a step. There's something that happens when you physically take a step. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to take a step to say, as for me in my life, whether you're a teenager, not my parents' faith, not my grandpa, no, as for me in my life, I'm gonna serve Jesus. If everyone across this room could stand, all of us,
If you're the kind of person that says, you know what? As for me and my house, I want to serve Jesus. I just want you to leave your seat right now and just come meet me down front. As for me and my house, I want to serve God. We want to be the family, the home that serves Jesus. This is a moment for you to surrender to God, a moment to give your family to Him. This moment is fitting to maybe pray for a spouse, pray for a kid, maybe pray for a grandkid, but you're just saying, hey, you know what, I want to take a step, just a physical step to say, God, as for me and our house, I want to serve you. The worship team is going to lead us. I just ask that, man, respond however God's moving in your heart. You might not be able to make it all the way down to the front. That's okay, but just take a step, maybe to the aisle. Just take a step today. Just let God know, as for me and my house, I want to serve you.